AM radio, an op-ed column, and Fox News is not enough. I want a center-right nation to fight for its soul, and its soul is represented in the arts. Its soul is represented in, in a world in which media is everything. AM radio is the lowest form of communication. It's tinny. It's not robust. It's not avatar. I want avatar. I want the right to enter the world of media to the extent and invest in media the way that the left does. The fake media is trying to silence us, but we will not let them because the people know the truth. The fake media tried to stop us from going to the White House, but I'm president and they're not. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast, a Breitbart.com podcast. The podcast starts now. Here's Kurt with today's headlines. Hey guys, welcome to another edition of the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Long weekend. I missed you guys. It's been a great first couple weeks. I can't tell you. Last week, closing out the week with what we did with Candace Owens and Sean Spicer, and I feel like, uh, well, I'm trying to keep up the pace with my producer uh, in, in this little leprechaun is doing some, some magic. So anyway, we got a great show lined up for you today. Very interesting conversation to be had with Matt Philbin, who uh, uh, is the managing editor for Media Research Center, shadow banning and what's happening and, and the fact that it is real uh, and what it means. And then after that, Francis Martell, our national security editor, will join us. But first, I want to get to some sound bites. I can't remember the saying, but if you want to disappear in politics, one of the two jobs to take is uh, is is vice president, apparently, because I don't remember the last time I heard this guy speak. But he did. On Fox News uh, the other day, Vice President Mike Pence was talking about things that make the left go crazy. But I listen to him talk about the, uh, the administration's economic policies up through today on Sunday Morning Futures. 4.1% growth. Your reaction? We were expecting a big number. It's a great day for America. See in the second quarter, 4.1% growth. Uh, exports growing dramatically. Uh, that added to the reality of 3.7 million new jobs created since Election Day 2016. I, I just I, I, I couldn't be more proud to serve alongside a president who's been working every day to keep the promise he made to the American people, to roll back red tape, to cut taxes, unleash American energy. And I think this 4.1 percent quarter and a year that's on track for more than 3 percent growth is a testament to the president's leadership and his vision for this economy. What were the most important takeaways from this quarter? A lot of conversation about whether or not this is a one quarter thing or whether or not we're going to see this sustain. Well, it's important to recognize in context that the reality is in the last two administrations, the economy grew by less than 2%. And in the first 18 months of this administration, we were a little shy of 3% last year. We're on track to be at 3% or better this year. And, and we really believe the, the internals of these numbers, whether it be the dramatic increase in business investment, a dramatic increase in American exports, all support the conclusion that the policies that President Trump has been advancing, uh, that a Republican Congress has been supporting, are actually working to revive this economy. But, it, but you sense real momentum. You know, I was, I was in North Dakota and Montana this week, in West Virginia just a couple of days ago. And you sense out on the street talking to everyday Americans, talking to business leaders, that the best is yet to come, that these, these numbers tell the tale, but the enthusiasm and the confidence all across this country among business leaders and businesses large and small tells the same story and more. I get frustrated sometimes when people aren't as eloquent as they should be. Don't go to sleep on the fact that the last two administrations, you do realize the last two administrations comprise of 16 years, Right. In the last 16 years, it's totaled less than 2%. We're going to be over 3% for the year. We're at 4.1% for the quarter. That absolutely should be mind-boggling. 3.7 million new jobs since Election Day. I mean, this is, this is amazing stuff. We'd love to continue to tell you that it is, uh, uh, the world's about to end tomorrow. 
Anyway, Dan Bongino is someone who I've become a huge fan of. I've gotten to know. I've had him on the show many times. I want you to listen to his response to the conservative movement's new MVP, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Her plan for taxes, and I, I got a number for you after this. It's going to blow you away. So listen up. She tweeted that the GOP is weak on fighting for working class Americans, weak on crime, weak on equal rights, weak on national security, weak on rejecting racism, weak on moral courage, weak on family values. So, you know, she says, hey, look, this is uh, this is the problem with the Republican Party. What say you? Yeah, yeah, that's just a genius tweet. Yeah, we're weak on borders. We want a border wall. That'll definitely weaken up the border. Weaken on family values. That's that's a fascinating new twist. Griff, is she just making this up? I, I, I mean, seriously, I, she may need an intervention after that tweet right here. That is insane. Why would you even write that? She doesn't even understand basic facts, by the way. That when she says the thing about fair share, you know, the top one percent of earners pay forty percent of income taxes. Think federal income taxes. Think about that. One out of a hundred people working their butts off out there mm -hmm. is paying 40 cents of every dollar. The top 20% of earners are, are paying up at 70 to 80 percent. Now, by the way, new rules on talking about the economy since Trump is in office, and I want to thank him for this. One, we're not apologizing for hard work anymore. Number two, we don't owe you a dime more, Captain Federal Government. Not a dime. Every time we give you a dollar, you waste it. You flushed our Social Security down the toilet. You ruined the education system. You're drowning us in 20 trillion in debt. We're not giving you any more money. You hear what we're talking about? New rules. No moss. No more money for you. <laughs> Okay, you've ruined it. You've ruined all your credibility. It's not that the government is too big. It's that it's too dumb to spend our money the right way. We'll keep it now. Thank you very much. One of the issues here is, is and, and I, I know this might sound very basic, but I, I would really, if you want to understand what we're getting ready to talk about, write the number one trillion down, okay? Try, I can't get it on my calculator, but I'm not smart enough to use a calculator into the trillions. But, but take one trillion and divide it by 300 million, which is how many people are in this country, all right? One trillion. Just, I just want you to understand what a, a trillion dollars is and understand this number. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez wants free Medicare for all. The cost of that, free Medicare for all, would be $32.6 trillion dollars. 32 point, divide $32.6 trillion by $300 million, which is how many people there are, not how many tax-paying citizens with jobs there are. We know that number is well over a record number of 155-plus million people are working right now. But think about that. This woman is the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, every time she opens her mouth, uh, uh, another conservative voter is born, and it's a wonderful thing. But the fact of the matter is we've lost sight, and the left has made us, I think. And, and I'm, when I, I shouldn't say that. The beltway, the beltway, left and right, the, uh, the entrenched swamp of Republicans and Democrats have made you lose understanding, I think, of what billions of dollars. A billion is an unimaginable number, guys. Especially when you think about it in context of your life, but a trillion is beyond so far beyond it. Thirty-two point six trillion dollars is what Medicare for all would cost. That's just ridiculous. So let's go to uh, NBC Nightly News and uh, listen to the uh, four point one percent. And notice the sarcasm at the beginning. Listen up. From the Atlantic to the Pacific, more evidence today of a strong economy. The 4.1% economic growth in the second quarter, the strongest since a 5% quarter in 2014 during the Obama administration. President Trump today was quick to take credit. These numbers are very, very sustainable. This isn't a one-time shot. I happen to think we're going to do extraordinarily well in our next report next quarter. In Chicago, real estate technology company Trust, started just a year ago, has already gone from six to 33 employees. CEO Andrew Bulker is still hiring. Why the optimism? What's happening here on the ground in Chicago? I, I, it's a vibrant economy, and, and I think people are positive about how it's going to turn out for them. And it's um, certainly from a small to medium-sized business, there's a lot of support. Corporate leaders suggest last year's tax cut gave the economy a jolt. Now, a sudden surge in agricultural activity before the trade war and tariffs kicked in appear to have provided a sudden one-time boost. Nobel Prize winning economist Lars Peter Hansen. Trade wars could be a substantial drag on the economy because the economy these days is integrated. One country starts imposing tariffs and other ones counterbalance that. 
Areas of lingering concern, stagnant worker wages, a growing budget deficit, and farmers who are paying the price for trade disputes with China, Mexico, and Canada. Our corn commodity prices are down approximately 25% since the first year. We're operating at a loss right now. The country's strong economic growth comes at a time when we're also experiencing the longest streak of hiring on record. Unemployment just 4% and robust hiring going on in business, manufacturing, and health care. First off, did you notice that, that, and it's subtle stuff like this, uh, Trump was quick to take credit. He didn't take any credit for that. He just mentioned the numbers. There was no credit taking there. Uh, every time they can get a stupid dig in, the guy's company grew by 500% from an employee perspective. Yet you heard them say could be, should be, might be. None of them said anything about how awesome it was. They all mentioned what, how bad it potentially could be, not how good it is. I think it's hilarious, and, and it's well, I mean, it's the, the delusion and dementia that continues to follow and push the left. Listen to on CNN, Larry Kudlow, I think, threw a wrench in CNN's uh, day by talking about China's, the China tariffs and Trump's pursuit of them. Listen up. Policies matter a lot, Jake, and, and I think the president deserves a victory lap. Low tax rates, rolling back regulations, opening up energy, for example. Um, trade reform, which I think is already paying off with respect to the EU agreement we did last week. Fundamentals of the economy look really good. You know, just parsing through some of these numbers, the 4.1% quarter, um, inventory is very low, cap goods booming, business investment spending really booming. That's a productivity creator. That's a job creator. That's a wage creator for ordinary Main Street folks. Terribly important. In fact, the saving rate was revised higher by $500 billion. That gives consumers plenty of ammunition. And as I say, um, as Mr. Trump has made it very clear that he intends to reward success, he's not trashing businesses. Mm -hmm. He wants people to just take a rip at the ball. You're seeing the results of these new policies. Now, we've got uh, five Trump quarters, um, just under 3%, 2.9%. This was 4.1%. The first half was 3.1%. I don't see any reason why we can't run this for several quarters, again, in technical terms. Rock bottom inventories and a capital goods investment boom from business, those are very strong factors. I that had to just make Jake Tapper's stomach ball up in a knot. Good stuff, though. And all of it pretty, I, I don't understand how it's hard to understand. Also, you might want to check out, he mentioned the uh, the savings rate. Check out what that actually means, $500 billion into the savings coffer. That's important to you and to I, uh, to me. Anyway, uh, my first guest today is going to be Matt Philbin. And the reason I want to mention that is because of this next soundbite. Matt and I are going to talk about something that's happening. But on the floor the other day, uh, House Intelligence Committee Chairman Devin Nunez had been talking about a couple different things. He went on Fox News, uh, Sunday Morning Futures, and talked about what Twitter and Facebook are doing. Uh, and, and I want you to listen to pretty much how serious they're starting to take this stuff. I'm going to ask you about what's going on with Twitter and shadow banning. The president tweeted about it. Do you think social media is censoring uh, conservative views and conservative uh, speakers? Yeah, you know what? I didn't even I did. I had no idea what shadow banning even was. Right. I, had, I had absolutely no clue. I, I had over, over so for several months. People have been contacting me saying that, hey, I tried to find you on on Twitter. I, you know, I couldn't find your account. Uh, why is that? Uh, and then you had a, a report that came out where, in fact, there were four people in the House of Representatives and, and the only four politicians in the country, the elected officials that were being, quote unquote, well, they don't call it shadow banning, but effectively we were getting caught up in some type of trap right. to where people couldn't see our Twitter feed. That was that was uh, Mr. Gates, right. Mr. Meadows, Mr. Jordan and myself. OK, so I, I don't know what Twitter's up to. Uh, it sure looks to me like they're censoring people mm. and they ought to they ought to stop it. Yes. And we're looking at any legal uh, uh, remedies that we can go through. I don't know what he means by legal remedies, but I, I, you're gonna, and I'm gonna ask Matt about that, and you're gonna listen to Matt talk about that because that that seems to me to be a potentially very uh, deep, dark rabbit hole to head down because giving legal remedies to internet content to some of the most corrupt, and not Devin Nunez or the House Freedom Caucus, but some of these Maxine Waters and well, all of her cohorts. Uh, can you imagine giving? Uh, legal remedies to to a woman like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez to internet content that that's a terrifying thought. So anyway, we're going to take a short break, and joining us after the break will be Matt Philbin, 
Uh, Matt is uh, the managing editor for Media Research Center's Culture, and we're going to talk about a very surprising uh, source for an article on shadow banning and how and why it's happening and who's doing it. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Why did we see some of the Republican kissing of Mark Zuckerberg that was taking place. I called it kissing the ring because I felt like every single person practically had to kiss the ring of this guy, you know, who wants to do nothing except get all those people out of office. So, you know, bizarre, bizarre behavior from the Republicans. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. Welcome back, guys. You just heard the soundbite from Devin Nunez on the Fox News Sunday Morning Futures talking about legal remedies potentially for Twitter and shadow banning. I know there's been a lot of conversation about this. As someone who has been shadow banned, and I know that for a fact because I went back uh, about a year and a half ago and I started kind of paying attention to the analytics of my website – uh, and in the last uh, year and a half to two years, I've gained almost 200,000 followers while at the same time watching my Twitter account move up about 1,200 people total. Uh, but the uh, Media Research Center is someone who has been on top of a lot of different things as we've gone through this last 18 months. And one of the gentlemen that has been at the forefront of that is uh, joining me now is Matt Philbin. He's the managing editor for Media Research Center's Culture. Morning, Matt. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm good. I'm glad you guys have come out with it because, uh, I mean, I've seen it. I've experienced it personally, and I know something just happened to my Twitter account in the last two weeks as well. But you're watching this shadow ban story, and it's absolutely legit, number one. And number two, mm-hmm. I, I was wondering if you could talk about the evidence you guys have seen, number one. and But more importantly, number two, what does it mean? Why would the left try and kind of poo-poo this and the right is having a, a huge issue with it? I mean, I think a lot of reasons should be made clear to the public. Well, look, the, the first the, – as to why it matters to the right, uh, we're the ones getting shadow banned. We're the ones who uh, are being, you know, it, there there are things happening on social media only to conservatives, not to liberals. And uh, it's it's become very obvious. It's so obvious that we have done a large study on it. And um, it, it it it's very plain uh, that across platforms from from Twitter to Facebook to Google, there is a conscious bias against conservatives. Um, the people in these companies, these companies are left wing. The people in the companies are left wing. They right. admit that. That's right. You know, and that's fine. But the problem is, what are they doing to ensure that their bias doesn't get into the platform? And clearly, they're not doing enough. A couple things. First off, I'm a free market guy. I don't like the government messing in the private sector. However, when you've become as influential socially as those two companies clearly are, the bigger issue for me is, listen, it's okay for me for for them to be liberal, but they're presenting that as kind of a a, a byproduct of who they and what they are without realizing the ramifications. I was wondering, there are are a bunch of different kinds of shadow bans. I know my Twitter account was shadow banned, and basically it meant that uh, uh, people weren't – I was getting a lot of people saying, hey, you haven't been really active – uh, about this and, and, and you know on Twitter or Facebook and I said well, I've been as active as I've always been they're not getting notifications and basically shadow banning is effective because what they're doing is they're shutting down your social media account without you being aware of it so you're continuing right. to operate normally day to day in life and, and I'm wondering give me some other names of people that you've run into that have had to deal with this I know I know there's some pretty powerful people well in the uh, in that vice article um, that brought attention to this. And I must say, vice is left wing. They are no yep. friends to conservatives. And uh, I think it's it's important to note that, um, you know, but they found this uh, awful enough to uh, to bring to our attention. Um, the others, uh, Representative Mark Meadows from North Carolina, uh, Representative Jim Jordan from Ohio, who is now running for uh, uh, the Speaker. speakership. Yep. Uh, Representative Matt Getz from Florida and Devin Nunez. It's subtle too, right? I mean, it's something as simple as autofill. 
when you're looking That's for what... certain things on Twitter or on Facebook, actually any platform anymore, especially Google, I've noticed an enormous change in Google. As I try to research American history and look up American history, it took me about an hour to find out any data and information on the black vote prior to 1936. And I found out hmm. why, which it just little things like that. But if I, if I look up uh, Jim Jordan or Mark Meadows, I don't get an autofill in the search engine, and especially with the, ability, uh, the inability of people to actually use the English language these days. That's a big deal. It is. And uh, it doesn't happen if you already follow them. Uh, right. If you are friends with them on Twitter or, or followers. But if I were to – I don't follow any of these people. If I were to go and look them up, um, apparently it wouldn't autofill. I'd have to go the whole way. And, yep. you know, part of the, you know, you're counting on uh, people in an age of um, really short attention spans to follow through with that. It, it's going to put a lot of people off, and they're not going to find the, the people they're looking for if, if it takes more than one step. So, um, you know, this is, this is a very subtle thing. Um, but the interesting thing is the uh, Gizmo, Gizmodo, the Vice site that looked into this, they noted that not a single member of the 78-person Progressive Caucus faces the same situation in Twitter search. <laughs> While they're trying to be subtle at it, they suck. They suck at lying. <laughs> Thank God, they suck at lying and cheating and stealing. They, they get away with it, but they just they don't get away. Uh, uncaught. It's just when we catch them, no one does anything, which I, I, I got to believe that given what we have learned about uh, or what we're, we've been told about Facebook and Twitter's impact on the last election, that there's going to be some sort of government interference uh, on this uh, election with both of them. Let me ask you, is there a way that you can kind of help people out if, if they believe they're following someone that's been shadow banned or they themselves have been shadow banned? What, what should they do? What can they do? Any advice? Really, what I can do is tell you how to find out more about this. Okay. Um, we have a site uh, called stopcensoringconservatives.com. dot com, okay. and there is a there is a re full report there um, that you can download uh, that we did back in the winter, and it lays everything out um, pretty in in pretty good terms. We right. sort of go through and say what's what's true and what's not true. Um, and I think that is, and you can look at what the conservative coalition um, against censorship wants from uh, these companies, which is, it's, it's simple. It's transparency, clarity on what hate speech is, um, equal footing for conservatives, and to you, and we're asking these companies to use the First Amendment as a guideline to, uh, to, to on how they operate, on how they regulate speech, yeah. um, and and it's simple. The First Amendment has been litigated since the country was founded. It works pretty well. Yep. So uh, that's all we're asking. And and so you guys have a piece uh, on newsbusters.org about the, the this whole thing with Vice claiming Twitter or shadow banning. Uh, StopCensoringConservatives.com is where you guys can go to find out, kind of navigate your way around this because this is uh, this is real, guys. Um, and it, I got to tell you, Matt, I, I'm with you. I was kind of caught off guard that, that, that Vice News um, called this out. And to me, that says that it is now so bad – that if they continue to try and hide it, they realize that they're going to look even stupider than they already do, because that's right. You know, it, it, it's this is this would be the equivalent of CNN saying Trump's doing a good job. I mean, you know, <laughs> the 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 depth and level of success would have to be stratospheric for that to happen. So, what do you think happens here? I mean, you heard we we I played a soundbite before you came on of uh, Representative Nunez talking about potential legal recourse. Is there is there literal is there seriously legal? action or, or uh, uh, repercussions? I hope not. Um, tell you the truth, I really do. I, I think that they can take care of this problem just by stepping up and being, uh, just be, by being transparent with everybody. But do you think they'll I don't do that? Know, uh, well, you know, they haven't shown uh, much inclination to yet. Uh, Twitter right. just announced that it's, it's got two different groups of academics 
uh, who are now going to work with it to uh, monitor one one aspect of it was um, uh, echo chamber, how an ep- echo chamber forms on Twitter and right. what effect that has. Um, and the other one is about how I, I think uh, how the discourse gets hostile or something, right. um, you know, so they're they're bringing in all this stuff. They're saying that they're doing this. Frankly, I have no confidence. I think Dorsey, uh, you know, Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, uh, talks around the issue all the time, refuses exactly to address Exactly like Zuckerberg. Exactly <clears throat> like Zuckerberg talking about, you know, oh, Congressman, I would disagree with your assessment. Well, you know what? This is, the, this is right back to the Clinton, you know, hey, it depends on what the definition of it is. <laughs> exactly. No, it's true. Uh, you know, Dorsey, yep. uh, after this article came out, Dorsey put out a, a thread of tweets uh, trying to explain it away, and all he did was dig the, dig the hole deeper. And yeah. it was uh, – David Burge called it next-level Orwellianism. I mean, this is – honest to God, I, it, they, these aren't government entities, but they might as well be because their influence on the left, on progressives, their ability and, and impact on the left and on – on elected officials of the left, they're going hand in hand, much like Hollywood is uh, with, with with the left. And so, yes, it is sort of a government thing because I haven't heard a Democrat yet. It, don't you find it somewhat ironic that you've got Nunez and Meadows and McDaniel and, and Getz and, and all these people, Jordan, talking out about it? I have not heard one elected one of those not one of those 78 people you mentioned has ever said anything about this i find that as very as telling as as, as the si- the silence on the left is as telling as the vocal response on the right to me well it, it's right i mean uh, to them it ain't broke so why fix it uh it's yeah. helping them out and it, it's you know i props to vice for for publishing this yeah. this um yep. it, it's very clarifying coming from a site that skews left. Well, and that isn't that kind of it makes my heart melt a little bit to think that there's somebody working at that company who has a conscience. They may be hard leaning left, uh, maybe liberal, maybe my God, global warming is the greatest uh, threat to mankind. <laughs> but they're not afraid to call out wrong, no matter who's on side. On. And I feel very much like that. I, I got to tell you, at Breitbart, I think I feel very comfortable. That we are that. If we saw something like that, I don't think for a second we'd hesitate to call it out. We wouldn't be happy about it, but that doesn't mean sure. we wouldn't report it. And right now, that's that's where we are right now. You can't you can't find anything from a news perspective. And I got to tell you, Matt, talk about real world implications. I've got one year of junior college under my belt. That hasn't stopped me from an education because I I read as much as anybody I've ever met in my life. And I, I research and I study things. I want to learn and get smarter about stuff. And in researching the history of the parties and all this other stuff, I found a horribly skewed algorithms inside of Google when I was searching you know, past history. Uh, like right. I said, I told you earlier, I, you know, I'm looking for the history of the black vote, and there was a big shift in the black vote in the 30s and blah, 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 1936. But, but finding out what the black vote did before 1936 was – was almost borderline like covert ops. I could. It was a nightmare to find data and information, even though it exists. And it's amazing to me to think that somebody is actively, a group of somebody's, are actively looking to impede. Because listen, you and I both know this. I don't know if you have kids or not, but the fact yeah, of the matter is, our kids think Wikipedia is the Encyclopedia Britannica, and that's a dangerous <laughs> no. thing. That's right. And, and, you know, and Wikipedia is only as true as the last person who used it, who updated. Right. Exactly Um, right. See, this is it's why this this fake news stuff is a problem. It's why uh, the situation is so polarized right now, because, frankly, there's there are very few sources you can turn to and say, yeah, I think that's the objective truth. Right. Um, Well, especially especially when. Go ahead. Sorry. sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, especially when a huge chunk of the left doesn't believe in an objective truth. One of the, the issues, and I'll, I've got to close it up here real quick in, in a minute, but one of the issues I have is that we've gotten to a place where there's two responses to a left argument and a right argument. They're the same. One is, yeah, but your guy does it too. Uh, mm-hmm. or, or two is, 
calling out, you know, people ask, why in the hell, you know, do you, do you mention Obama and Clinton? And I keep responding, well, I mention them because they're the very reason we are where we are. But when you call out something on the left, this whole, you know, ch- child trafficking, pedophilia thing coming out in Hollywood, it's almost as if there's so much misinformation out there that the left can just not even respond to an accusation or a crime. They can just come back with, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, mm-hmm. and, and Ninety percent of the yeah buts aren't actually true, but you, but you, the on the internet you can't find that information off off the top of the uh, of a search anymore, and so it's making yeah. information harder to find. And people are lazy by nature; they're going to choose the path of least resistance. I can't tell you how many Twitter arguments I've been in where the response has been uh, what I know to be a Google search, cut and paste of a picture that supports their argument mm-hmm. with no facts whatsoever, and that's their see gotcha right. And, and, you know, it's it's compounded by the fact that the old guard media won't report these things. Exactly the old guard right. media will not report what makes it uncomfortable. And yes. so, therefore, you're left battling without what used to be a, a sort of an authoritative source for what's going on. Well, Matt, we know we know from from what we've seen in the last year and a half to almost two years that. The left, the mainstream media people on the left have actually been guilty of that very thing. They've been guilty of doing no research other than a Google search to verify a claim or verify a a, a quote-unquote fact-checking. We know that that, that, uh, Snopes uh, and and PolitiFact and and all those others are hard left-leaning liberal-run websites who aren't fact-checking anything at all. They're trying to create a narrative that that supports a very progressive agenda. Which again, that's their prerogative, but they're advertising. It's false advertising. And and right. this generation and, of younger this younger generation is being is being hoodwinked to the point where they're being indoctrinated by a, a liberal education system. Absolutely true. I guess I would close by saying this. I think one thing you and I know for a fact is when you when you stand up on the side of conservatives, you are asking for the maybe uh, they're in the minority, but they're certainly more vocal and violent uh, uh, group of people to. Well, I mean, God, you saw it in the science climate change industry. You, you mentioned being opposed to it. Your life is ruined. They ruin your life. They ruin your career. It's happening in politics. We've seen it now happen with this whole Russia conspiracy. General Michael Flynn. Paul Manafort, these guys, their lives are over. Whether they did anything mm-hmm. wrong or not is not relevant. And I get back to the fact that the MRC and the things that you guys do there, you have to be running into opposition at every single turn because the things you're trying to do is expose the underbelly, the rotten, uh, maggot-infested underbelly of, of the left and who and what they're trying to do. That's true. You know, it's it's a it's a struggle every day. And uh, it, it to just trying to tell people what the other side is, trying to put a check on the media is is it's all we try to do and it's not an yeah. easy thing sometimes. That was a tremendous Freudian slip right there. Putting a check on the left wing media would be a very good thing to do for Twitter which would be a, a, a legitimate yeah. check. Matt, hey, listen, uh, uh, it's a pleasure. I'd love to have you back. I know you guys are in the, doing so much work. Where can people reach you guys? Go to newsbusters.org, and right. all our stuff's up there. Newsbusters.org, guys. Uh, stopcensoringconservatives.com if you want to find out all the work that they've done behind this. Matt, thank you so much. Love to have you back, pal. I'd love to come back. Breitbart News Tonight with Joel Pollack and Rebecca Mansour. The real thing that the left is angry about is they're like, how could you allow these Russian memes? Somebody saw a meme and then they decided they had to vote for Trump. Or it must have been fake news. And by fake news, they mean conservative websites. Come on. But this is what the left thinks. Fake news. And by fake news, what they mean is shut down Breitbart. Breitbart News Tonight. Weeknights, starting at 9 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patreon. 125. We want to hear from you. Tweet the show at Garrick38. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. Joining me now is Breitbart's National Security Editor, Francis Martell. Good morning, Francis. How are you? Good morning. Doing great. Thanks for having me. Hey, I want to ask you a question, and, and, and I want because I kind of want people to understand the correlation between the two. We're talking about potential tariffs and, and things as they relate to China. I was wondering, there are always national uh, security implications when you're talking about global trade. You know, what is and what isn't tariff, what is and what isn't available to trade. 
Uh, we know that the Clinton administration gave China uh, ballistic missile technology, which had nothing to do with trade. But but what what are the impacts right now, if any, that we might see short term from a potential trade war with China as it relates to national security? Well, China has relies almost exclusively on its economic power for its um, geopolitical heft. And I think that's true of almost every country except for the United States because our military is so robust independently that it can survive some economic damage. But for everybody else, that rule basically applies. The stronger your economy, the more influence you have on a global stage. And, and the converse of this is Russia, right? Russia has been trying for the past couple of decades to restore its uh, weight on, on the international stage. And its economy is just so meager that it doesn't really matter how much they want to be relevant, they just can't do it. Um, right. So when you have trade disputes with, with a country like China and you start reducing their ability oh, sorry, um, to operate um, economically, then you have um, you, you weaken significantly that country's ability to operate geopolitically as well. Is that not kind of at the heart of this whole Russia thing? I don't think people understand just how weak Russia's economy is and how much Russia's economy relies on importing, no matter what the material is. But we recently learned that green technology is not what it's thought to be because Germany trying to go as hard as it can to go green is now getting all of their natural gas from Russia. How much of a trade chip, how much of a bargaining chip is trade to from – because there's a ton of sanctions on Russia, and I don't know. They creep into just about everything policy-wise. How far could we go leveraging – trade with Russia let's say something, against something like the Crimea or, or, or getting them to recognize Crimea. I mean, is trade that powerful of a weapon with, a, with Russia? I think it is. I mean, I think it has diminished. I, if we hadn't put the sanctions in place that we would, um, it wouldn't have just been Crimea. It would have been South Ossetia and Ab Abkhazia and Georgia, which Putin invaded in 2008 when his economy was doing much better. And as soon as the sanctions started kicking in, he had to limit his soap there. Um, so I think the sanctions have had that concrete effect, which is, um, yes, he invaded and annexed Crimea, but it could have been a much greater piece of land that would have gone to Russia. Um, and, and the issue with Russia is that its economy is basically oil and gas. That's it. Um, and it relies on European trade to keep itself afloat. Um, and now a, a big question mark in Russia's future is China's One Belt, One Road program, which is this sprawling uh, infrastructure program where China is going to build every major railway, harbor, port, road um, in the world. That's the plan uh, in, the, in every corner of the world. But for Russia specifically, the problem is that China wants to build these roads in places like Kazakhstan and in Central Asia. It wants to go into places like Georgia or Montenegro, which is essentially Russia's door into Europe. Um, and if China succeeds, Russia is going to have to need China's permission to do any trade with Europe and to and it's going to be isolated and there's going to be a circle of Russian influence or Chinese influence around Russia. Um, so that's a huge problem, I think, in Putin's future. I think that's why we saw the summit between Trump and Putin, because um, there's a real opportunity for some cooperation there, because if Russia doesn't help stop China from controlling trade in that region, it's essentially going to die an economic death. Um, and yeah. that, that almost has nothing to do with sanctions. But of course, if without the sanctions, Russia could diversify its economy, and it simply can't. Um, so it's in a pretty dire economic situation right now. Uh, speaking of China, uh, Xi Jinping was uh, talking last week, and uh, you did an article on it, and I'm very curious. I, I don't understand this, and, and maybe you can help me understand it. Uh, Xi Jinping was, was offering a, uh, a tremendously vocal defense of globalism and uh, how the, the – I think the quote is, the, the evolution of global governance system will have a profound impact on the development of all countries. Why would China even pretend to voice concern for other countries, number one? And number two, China under a globalist system – I'm assuming China is assuming a globalist system that would represent Chinese values and, and customs, not – this is a country that is it is the epitome of a communist country in a dictatorial place. Why would they be pushing or defending globalism, and what's in it for them? 
Well, the the globalism that they're trying to defend is actually simply Chinese colonialism. It's the globalism okay, of Britain in the 18th century, where the entire globe was Britain, and therefore we have globalism. Um, so it's not the idea of a multipolar world or the idea that we're going to have some sort of pluralistic um, world community. What China wants is exactly what you said, to spread Chinese values um, all around the globe. And by Chinese values, I mean extreme censorship of uh, dissenting voices and uh, it, total it, state Francis, control. It, it, let me ask you complete. something. Mm-hmm. In, in, a, in a nutshell, it's not really different than the desire of, for the spread of Islam, is it? I mean, Islam is all about, they would love globalism as long as that globalism involved a, a planet uh, under the rule of Allah. You know, I mean, that, that's there's not much difference there from a potential resolution perspective well yes the only difference is is the racial aspect of it anyone can convert to islam nobody can become chinese if they're not born chinese and and xi jinping has made it very clear that he believes in han chinese supremacy with the oppression of minorities in china you have people like the uyghurs the tibetans who are extremely repressed and are forced to learn mandarin um and to essentially assimilate so it's a similar concept but it's almost even more repressive because at the end of the day if it Islamist regime shows up and you convert to Islam, you're good. <laughs> but you can't do that with um, Chinese ethno-nationalism. Right. And I have a feeling that's quite a few of the countries involved in, in pushing globalism. That they're they're pushing it right up to a point when the when the rubber meets the road, it's going to be yeah. As long as the globalism involves Chinese values and assimilation of the Chinese way, then we're all for it. Hey, I want to switch gears real quick. Something that's been really under the radar. Uh, and, and has not gotten the publicity it needs, except for at Breitbart. Pastor Andrew Brunson, who was detained in Turkey. Explain real quickly, if you can, how that came to be, number one. And number two, what's the latest news on, on his situation? Sure. So Pastor Andrew Brunson is from North Carolina, and he's been preaching uh, the gospel in Turkey, in Izmir, I believe, for over two decades. And he essentially, he has a little church. Every, he, it's open to anyone. And he gives sermons, and he, he spreads the word of, of God. He's a Christian pastor. He was accused in 2016 of being an associate and spy for both uh, Fethullah Gulen, who is an Islamic cleric, uh, who lives in the United States, and for the uh, Kurdistan Workers' Party, which is a Marxist terrorist organization. So um, the Turkish government is claiming that this Christian is secretly working for both an Islamic and an atheist organization, which makes absolutely no sense. Um, and he was arrested in the aftermath of the failed coup against President Erdogan in uh, July 2016. I believe he was arrested in November 2016. Um, and essentially, Erdogan has made it clear that he doesn't believe that Brunson has done anything wrong, but he wants to use Brunson as a hostage to trade for Gulen. Um, Gulen has denied any involvement in the coup, but they have a long-standing political rivalry that resulted in Gulen coming to the United States, fleeing um, from, from Erdogan's repression. And Erdogan has said, "We, I will trade this pastor for that pastor about Gulen and Brunson. So it is abundantly clear that Brunson has done nothing wrong um, and that he's being used as a hostage. And President and so Trump this- has, uh, as of Friday, I believe, um, threatened to impose sanctions on Turkey and said, hey, we're not going to do business. We're not going to enrich your country when you're using our citizens as hostages. And, and Erdogan exactly responded business. yesterday with a very belligerent speech saying, you know, Turkey is a glorious empire and we're not allowing anyone to boss us around. So we're in a, in a stalemate situation at the moment. This is essentially an American citizen being held hostage, period. There's no other uh, uh, story or, or pretty setting to put that in. Someone has taken an American citizen hostage and... I have a different president in the White House who doesn't, I think, play by the old rules. And and I would like to see this resolve itself with maybe Turkey down a couple uh, soldiers and and us with a a citizen returned back to us. Hey, what's the next step with Russia? Uh, I, I saw last night that Putin, apparently there's an invite extended from the Kremlin to President Trump to to make the second meeting happen there for whatever that's worth. Where do you see this going in the next 20, 30 days? Well, there's, I think there's a lot of mutual distrust between Washington and Moscow, and, and rightfully so on, on both sides. Right. But again, the, the China issue is so big, and it's bigger for Russia than it is for us because China's right there. 
um, yep. that they're going to have to schedule some more talks with the United States and they're going to have to deal with um, with the China issue. And they're going to do it behind the scenes because reporters aren't even going to ask it's either president anything about China, which is the most important issue. They're just going to go up and complain about the Hillary Clinton and the 2016 alleged hacking and all that stuff. So right. we might not even hear what they talk about because no one's going to ask that at any press conference. Um, but I do believe within the next month we might see some, at the very least, scheduling of high-level meetings that might not involve the presidents but could involve senior diplomats. Um, but the conversation has to continue. I think from the perspective of Russia, they have no choice. Um, the alternative is having Xi Jinping basically overrun um, every country that borders Russia and, and being yeah. isolated and having no allies. So I, I guess I would equate uh, China is Russia's uh, South America. I mean, they are literally on the border, at the border, and uh, a couple feet away from Russian soil. And, uh, you know, I, 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 let me close out with asking you this question. It's a very open-ended question, and I'm not looking for a deep answer because I'm not sure anybody really knows it. What – what do you think that the Trump administration's goal is uh, with Russia over the next 12 to 24 months? I think uh, the Trump administration is looking for Russia to get into a comfortable place where they accept that we're going to have to do something about One Belt, One Road. We're going to have to do something about China and that they can sort of set aside other differences and continue to be rivals in terms of uh, alliances with Ukraine and with Europe. And the sanctions are still going to be there. But to at least get Putin to have this very important conversation, which, again, is more important for Putin than it is for Trump, about containing China, I think that's the number one goal because and, no country and, 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 will be what? hurt more than Russia. I, I, I lied. I'm going to ask you one more question. Does, <laughs> sure. th th does some sort of potential resolution in the South China Sea get put on the table? Because I look at that as probably one of the more fearful – one of the things that bothers me more than anything is the fact that – China is, is just unopposed in the South China Sea as it expands, and the billions and billions of dollars of, of shipping lanes that run through that territory, there's going to be a rubber meets the road moment here, and I don't think that's a good thing. Absolutely not. I mean, China calls the South China Sea the Maritime Silk Road, and it claims that it has ownership over all of it, which is illegal. International courts have said that this is nonsense, but China still insists, and it has that military. Um, I would be pretty surprised to see a Russian military presence in the South China Sea in, in soon, in the short term, because it would be so belligerent and obvious. Um, but ultimately, you know, we have been working with allies like Australia and New Zealand and the Philippines. And these are countries that are there alone. They will be able to do nothing to stop China. But I think as the coalition grows, um, it can be more formidable. And if Trump succeeds in getting some of those countries to trust that Russia has a stake in participating in curbing China in that part of the world, then maybe you will see a Russian ship there or, or you know, yeah. I think it would be later rather than sooner. But I don't yeah. think it's off the table completely. Yeah. And the pace with which that's happening should be very worrisome to many, many people, especially Japan. Uh, hey, Francis, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, and we'll catch up again soon. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks again to Matt Philbin and Francis Martel. Good stuff. Uh, always a pleasure to, to catch up on stuff. And, and again, one of the goals of this podcast is, is to try and, and talk to you guys about things that are talk with the people about things that will impact your daily life. And one of the things that, that, uh, could potentially look to Europe if you want to see what, what, uh, globalists want for America, the European justice system is a farce. It's a joke. This is why, if I'm in the UK, why Brexit better happen for me. Apparently, a European Court of Human Rights, a body of judges, they're planning to block the death penalty for Islamic terror suspects and ordering Britain to pay damages to the members of this group. It is absolutely beyond description, beyond belief. Uh, a letter from the Home Office to the U.S. Attorney General, which was leaked to the media last week, this is by Virginia Hale and Breitbart, prompted outcry from self-proclaimed human rights campaigners who noted Home Secretary Sajid Javid said Britain would not demand a no-death penalty assurance in the cases of Alexander Koti and El Shafi El Shika. On Thursday, it was revealed that Britain would force them to, to well, base, so you, you get the message. The EU judicial system is, is defending the human rights of these Islamic torturers, and I don't know that they are human or they should have any rights. That's our 
uh, our loser for today. The winner, you know what? I, I got to stick with the Freedom Caucus. Jordan and Meadows and these guys are pushing potentially an impeachment vote on Rosenstein. If he doesn't hand over documents, they're also, I think, holding Twitter's feet to the fire. And the more that those two things happen, the better. There's so much going on right now. In so many ways, we're being pulled back and forth. My runner-up winner today, by the way, was President Trump for his comment. Uh, and I believe him. He's going to shut down the government if wall funding is not in the next budget and catch and release isn't uh, isn't ended as well. And I, 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 his popularity, if that wall starts to get built any time, it's going to get built. I mean, I don't have any doubt about that. But if it starts to go up, physically starts to go up in the next couple of months, you're going to see his, I think, approval ratings go through the roof as they continue to rise anyway. Have a great day. God bless. Thank you, guys. Thanks again to Matt Feldman. Thanks again to Francis Martel. We'll catch up with you guys tomorrow. Take care, guys. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. Everything in hip hop is not bad. Kanye agreed with us, so let's love him today until he raps tomorrow and you turn your back. Because if you jump off when the fun of the moment is over, then you are in fact making Kanye the token he is accused of being. So please. Don't do that. Don't go there. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125.